Good morning, everybody. I am Marta Dina Arguello. We're going to get started. I'm the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I want to, before we get started, thank all of our panelists and our co-sponsors uh, for today's event. Um, what, the reason we're doing this event is for a number of reasons. We are seeing uh, California's climate policy go down a direction uh, that is troubling in the sense that we are making decisions, long-term decisions about climate policy that have impacts on our economy. More importantly, they have deep impacts on our individual health and community health, particularly for those who are living uh, in the current path of the fossil fuel production. Uh, particularly, you know, remember the pipelines are the arteries that move the oil from where it gets extracted to where it's going to get refined. And that infrastructure already exists in our communities. And much of the climate policies that are being proposed lay on top of that existing infrastructure, which means that we will deepen the harm that those communities are already experiencing. Additionally, I serve on the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for Climate, and I'm one of the longest serving members of that Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. So I've been watching the decisions that we've been making since 2006. And each, with each scoping plan, plan, I become increasingly alarmed that we are making decisions, long-term decisions, without fully understanding the full life cycle impacts, the full health impacts of these decisions that we're making that we have decided that our climate policy will rest on this concept of net zero. And if you believe in net zero, well, then it is easy to develop strategies and programs that rest on unproven technologies, unsafe technologies that promise us that we're going to do the things that we haven't done, which is remove carbon from the atmosphere without taking into consideration that we actually should stop emitting first. Uh, and the environmental justice community and the public health community has been very clear. We need direct emissions reductions. We need real zero options and technologies. And as you all are making these decisions, we hope that you remember the, the things you're learning in this uh, workshop yeah, right. about those long-term right, uh, health impacts of pipelines. Money. And so I'm- uh, My name, her name or her name. Okay, if we can, uh, some folks can meet themselves while we uh, continue. And so, uh, again, really, you know, today is about digging deep into the things we never hear about when we're listening to only proponents of these projects or regulators who are forced to meet really unrealistic net zero goals uh, that push aside other technologies and processes that actually might get us to real zero emissions reductions and to the thing that our communities have been demanding, and that's to improve the conditions of our air, water, and soil so we can actually live and thrive and be resilient in the face of oncoming climate crisis, which we have waited to, you know, we've waited too long to act. And so now we will have to deal with crises and accidents and more incidents, whether that's fire, water contamination, and all the, all the range of impacts that we, we can expect to see because of our delay in taking the kinds of actions that we need to plan out a real just transition away from fossil fuels. And so uh, our first speaker up is Amanda McKay with the Pipeline Safety Trust, who will be talking about pipeline safety issues, followed by Dr. Ted Shetler, who will be talking about the health impacts of pipelines, and uh, we often ignore those. And then Jack Willingham, who has uh, firsthand had to respond to an incident, and we can expect to find those incidents. And finally, Lupe Martinez, who will be talking from a community perspective. Uh, and it's incredibly important to listen to these voices, to know what questions to ask of proponents of projects so that we can actually solve the climate crisis without making things worse for low-income communities. And we wanna make sure that as we choose alternatives and technologies, that those solutions aren't crowding off the table things that we can be doing now, that we're being prudent with the funds that we have, that we are making those investments in things that actually get us to that transition into a non-fossil fuel economy. And those are the things that we ne desperately need. And so we don't want to spend a lot of opportunity costs and a lot of our tax dollars on solutions that simply extend the life of fossil fuels and continue to pollute communities. If we're serious about environmental justice, we have to make decisions that are informed 
by understanding the full life cycle costs and impacts and the health impacts. And so without further ado, I'd like to uh, bring up Amanda. Ted is first. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Ted. Okay, Shetler. thank you, <laughs> Emma. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Martha. And welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Emma, for showing my slides. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about some of the health and safety risks of carbon capture, uh, transport, and storage. Next slide, please. Uh, just to point out that there are hazards and risks associated with each stage of that, and I will briefly uh, summarize those. Next slide, please. Uh, when we're thinking about carbon capture, we uh, have to realize that doing that actually requires energy. So if we were to put carbon ca capture technology onto a power plant, uh, that would actually cause that plant to use uh, about 12 to 40 percent more energy per kilowatt hour of electricity produced than a plant without that capture. And that means that there will be increased emissions from that power plant that has that technology applied, except, of course, for the CO2, and unless additional pollution control is added, which is largely an economic decision. So this means there will be more ozone and particulate air pollution released from that power plant with impacts experienced largely in local communities. Next slide, please. Now, to capture the CO2 uh, from fossil fuel combustion, uh, the flue gas from the power plant or other industrial facility is commonly passed through uh, solvents, which come are, uh, are typically amine solvents. That's a family of chemicals that are capable of absorbing CO2. Uh, then that amine solvent CO2 mixture is sent to a distiller where it is heated and the CO2 is released from the amine and collected, uh, the amine solvent is then recycled to capture more CO2. And in the process of this recycling of the amines, they are degraded both by other contaminants in the flue gas and also by the repeated heating and ultimately be, must be disposed of as hazardous waste. There are a number of contaminants in this amine waste that generally include carcinogens and other toxic degradation products. And the amount of this waste is not insignificant. Uh, a million uh, metric tons of CO2 captured by this technology typically results in somewhere between 300 and 3,000 metric tons of amine waste that then must be disposed of as a hazardous waste. Next slide, please. So then the carbon dioxide is decontamination, decontaminated and compressed at over a thousand pounds per square inch into what's called a dense phase or supercritical phase for long distance pipeline transport. Su supercritical CO2 has properties of both gases and liquids. Its density is similar to a liquid. Its vis viscosity is similar to a gas. So it flows easily through the pipeline. Next slide, please. Now I wanna talk a little bit about carbon dioxide. It's a colorless, odorless, non-flammable gas. It's heavier than air. Uh, at sufficient concentrations, it's an asphyxiant. That means that it displaces oxygen. But in addition to oxygen deprivation, it also has toxic properties because when CO2 encounters water, it forms carbonic acid, which then begins to acidify, acidify blood and tissues. So uh, carbon dioxide is classified as a hazardous substance by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. And I've shown here on this slide, the permissible exposure limit according to OSHA is 0.5% in the ambient air averaged over eight hours. And according to NIOSH, uh, the exposure should not exceed 3% over any 15 minute period. These are typically uh, uh, problems that are encountered in the workplace where there may be people who are working in confined spaces. But these, these percentages also apply to the outdoors as well. And keep in mind now, NIOSH says not to exceed 3% over any 15 minute period. Next slide, please. Here I've shown on this chart, uh, on the left uh, 
column, various CO2 concentrations. In the middle, the health effect, and on the right, the onset of those symptoms. And you begin to see here that at 2% of concentration of carbon dioxide in the ambient air, you immediately get increased uh, respiratory effort to try to breathe out the excessive amounts of CO2. At 4% in the ambient air, uh, the increase in breathing becomes distressing. And now you begin to get uh, the acidification of the blood. And at this point, NIOSH says that 4% is immediately dangerous to life and health. And that's not only because of the respiratory acidosis, but now we begin to get other symptoms, including confusion and neurological uh, uh, symptoms that create, uh, 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 which, which impair the ability of a person to understand that they're in trouble and to get to safety. And remember, this gas is both colorless and odorless. So a person may not know what's going on at that point. As, as the concentrations in the ambient air increase, you see it becomes increasingly dire at five to 10% uh, concentration in the air can lead to unconsciousness within a few minutes. More than 10% can cause death within 10 minutes and at 20% uh, death within one minute. Next slide, please. So keeping that in mind, when uh, folks are making decisions about the siting and uh, 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 route of pipelines, uh, they need to go through a, a, a whole series of considerations. You need to anticipate the amount of CO2 that could be released uh, unanticipated from a, a, a leak or a rupture. And then you have to think about how it would disperse. And that would depend uh, not only on the volume release, but also the wind speed and direction and the topography of the area where the rupture occurred. You need to think about the population that's potentially exposed. How close are they? How many are they? Uh, what, what's the nature of the population? And then you need to figure out what you're trying to predict and prevent. Are you trying to uh, prevent concentrations of 3% or higher for the reasons I've just described? Are you trying to prevent deaths? You need to be specific about what endpoint you're thinking about. Next slide, please. And finally, I just want to point out that there are some concerns with the sequestration process as well. For example, if the CO2 is pumped deeply underground into an area that's thought to be able to accept the CO2 and sequester it forever, you need to think about the risks of leakage back into the atmosphere, which could occur through cap rot fractures or well penetrations uh, from previous uh, uh, well development for oil and gas development. Then there's also the possibility of the CO2 migrating upward into drinking water aquifers, which can cause acidification there, which then will cause heavy metals and radionuclides to leach out into the drinking water supply. And finally, we need to be concerned about earthquakes, which could be triggered from the excessive pressure generated by pumping large amounts of CO2 underground. Thank you very much, Emma. And that's all I have, Martha. <clears throat> and I think now it is Amanda. I'm not looking at, I can't close my screen. So I believe Amanda's up. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ted, for that um, really wonderful overview of the health and safety risks. Um, oh. My name is Amanda McKay. I am the policy manager for an organization called the Pipeline Safety Trust. Next slide, please. Um, the Pipeline Safety Trust is a national nonprofit watchdog organization for pipeline safety across the U.S. Um, we formed in the aftermath of a tragedy, pipeline tragedy in Bellingham, Washington, that took the lives of three boys in 1999. Ever since then, we've been working to ensure that tragedies such as this don't happen in other communities. Next slide, please. So in looking a little bit about the history of CO2 pipelines um, regulation and um, funding wise, so in 1986, there was a natural release of CO2 out of a lake. Um, it killed about 1,700 people and that really woke up the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, the federal regulator on pipelines, um, woke them up 
up to the need to update their rules for CO2 pipelines. Um, however, they basically added and CO2 to um, the hazardous liquid regulations. Um, so that's how it was it was running basically since the 1980s. In 2020, there was a, a CO2 pipeline rupture in Satarsha, Mississippi that we're going to hear about a little bit later on. Um, and that kind of reminded everyone that we have these pipelines and they are dangerous. Um, and then you're talking about the 45Q tax credit expansion. Pipeline Safety Trust then published a paper on CO2 pipelines. And then you also have the Inflation Reduction Act. Next, next slide, please. So with these um, tax credit expansions, there's been this massive potential build out of CO2 pipelines, uh, both in California and across the country. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, as compared to the existing infrastructure of CO2 pipelines that we have right now, about 5,000 miles, um, you're looking at, you know, anywhere from 60,000 to 90,000 uh, miles of pipeline across the U.S. that's potentially going to be built out for these um, CCS projects. Um, and it's also really important to remember that they, essentially, all of these CCS projects are going to require pipelines, um, and so all of these all of these projects are going to bring pipelines into play one way or another. And so we need to be thinking about um, the regulations and safety recommendations. Um, California uh, is planning on writing their own recommendations, yet it's very unclear on how those will be implemented and enforced um, by the Office of the State Fire Marshal, which is the current regulator in California. Next slide, please. So a little bit of an overview on some of the CO2 pipeline risks. Um, so there, CO2 has very different physical properties from other hydrocarbons. So thinking about natural gas or um, gasoline, jet fuel, other um, hazardous liquids that are running through pipelines in California as of right now. Um, there's unique safety hazards, as, as Ted pointed out already, um, and we're talking about potential impact areas being measured in potentially miles and not feet. So um, thinking about uh, the, the incident in Satarsha, um, Satarsha wasn't even identified as a potential impact area. And so the pipeline operator wasn't sure that it was going to, that the plume was going to reach that town. So, um, and then we have a lot of regulation uh, questions about CO2 pipelines in general. And we've determined that as of right now, uh, these regulations are neither appropriate or sufficient to ensure safety from these lines. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about carbon dioxide in pipelines, um, I'm sure everyone's hearing a lot about the supercritical state. Ted mentioned it earlier. Um, that's because this is the current definition of carbon dioxide in the federal regulation. It's a fluid consisting of more than 90% carbon dioxide molecules compressed into a supercritical state. Below, there is a chart showing the temperature and pressure that CO2 needs to be at to be in a supercritical state. So that's above 87.76 degrees Fahrenheit and 1070 PSI. That's a really high temperature to maintain throughout the length of a pipeline. And so it's unlikely that these pipelines are actually going to be running at super in supercritical fluid state for the entire length of the pipeline, which brings in questions about whether or not they're even going to be regulated. Next slide, please. So Ted mentioned a lot of what is already on this slide, but I want to focus on um, the last two here um, in the, the lower right-hand corner. So um, rapid phase changes upon pipeline rupture can cause fracture propagation. Essentially, what this means is that pipelines have a potential to open up like a zipper in the event of a, a rupture. And so this creates the potential to have a lot more CO2 released into an area in a much shorter amount of time. 
Um, the other one is that carbon dioxide's inter interaction with impurities such as water, hydrogen, sulfide, and many others can compromise pipeline integrity um, and increase the risk of corrosion and failure. Next slide. So focusing mainly on the water in the CO2 pipelines, historically, CO2 pipelines have been transporting relatively dry, pure CO2. However, um, when we're talking about the expansion of CO2 being captured from other sources that we're not currently doing, um, the potential for impurities is extremely high and the potential for water entering into the pipeline stream is high as well. This um, is really concerning because water mixed with CO2 can cause carbonic acid, as Ted stated, and carbonic acid is extremely corrosive to steel. So you have that, that risk of corrosion in your pipeline and risk of failure and rupture. Next slide, please. So when looking at the regulatory shortfalls that we have right now, um, we're talking about there's only supercritical fluid CO2 is regulated. Other phases as of right now are unregulated. Um, and in fact, a, a frequently asked questions document from the Office of the State Fire Marshal uh, said that it does not regulate pipelines transporting CO2 as a gas or a liquid. Um, there is no federal oversight for um, rattling, uh, for siting and routing, as Ted mentioned as well. And, um, and this is a major issue when thinking about environmental justice concerns. There's kind of this puzzle piece patchwork approach to routing and siting when it comes to hazardous liquid pipelines. And so we need to make sure that uh, every entity that has that authority is well uh, educated on the potential risks of these lines. Um, currently, there's no odorant requirement. As Ted stated, CO2 is odorless, colorless. You might not even know that a CO2 pipeline has ruptured um, until it's too late. Um, inappropriate regulations to establish potential impact areas. There is no um, calculation to establish a, a, an accurate potential impact area for CO2 line rupture. Um, there's insufficient regulations to mitigate fra fracture propagation. Um, thinking about where valves are placed, that determines how much CO2 would be uh, released into the atmosphere upon rupture. And then uh, lastly, there's, there's really insufficient regulations on pipeline conversion. So the potential for converting a line that's already existing to CO2 service from some other service. So these are questions that haven't been answered that um, we think, we feel that it's really important to get uh, more research, uh, more development. And um, so, yeah, I think that that is all I have and I'll pass it over to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. You know, I wanna remind folks that many of these pipelines are in remote areas getting to health or getting out of communities may be really difficult, particularly with CO2 uh, pipelines. <clears throat> and the other part I wanna talk about in terms of regulation, the environmental justice movement exists because of the history of regulatory failure. These regulations were never designed to actually prevent harm and protect health. It was about what's acceptable risk. Uh, these decisions have never been based on informed consent from communities. Uh, and so while we appreciate the promise of regulation, you have to understand that our communities have faced uh, from pretty much every major industry, a real failure on the part of government to keep our community safe. And with that, I will hand it over to Jack Willingham. Oh, sorry about that, I had to unmute myself. Um, as you may or may not be aware, in 2020, we had a pipeline explosion incident here in Yazoo County. And the biggest issue we had to start with, a lot of you are not going to have because y'all are actually aware of what's happening and what's coming to you. Back in 2020, the, the, the pipeline operator that run their pipeline through Yazoo County, we weren't even aware of what we had. We weren't, we weren't aware there was a CO2 pipeline running through. We had not had this problem with other companies, uh, natural gas, your oil runners, everybody participated in 
most of your events, yearly training, LAPC, but this particular one happened. So on the night it happened, when we received a call, all the information we had was that there was a smell of rotten egg and uh, a green gas cloud running over the area of 433 and Highway 3, which is a very rural area of Yazoo County near Satarsha, Mississippi. So initially, we don't know what we're responding to. And uh, the 911 calls increased and increased, and we had people complaining that their vehicles were stopping, that they were losing consciousness, people couldn't breathe. So our first responders, as is, is we're setting up a command, I'm, I'm advising them, don't go into the town until we can determine exactly what we're dealing with. In your general hazmat training, when you hear of a, a, a green gas odor or a rotten egg smell, you're, you're worried about ammonia, you're worried about stuff like that. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time trying to determine where the leak was to start with without going in. And about 40 minutes into searching, is for, where, we, where we made a call to Denbury, who was a pipeline operator, and ask them had they had an incident. That's when they informed us after we called them that yeah, they'd had a loss of pressure almost 40 minutes to an hour before, which is when we were able to start. Knowing what we were dealing with COT, we, we were able to send responders in with uh, proper air packs and protection to try to get to some of the people that were trapped in the community. It was a community of about 55 people. And, and I heard the doctor earlier describing the medical conditions. We saw all of that. We saw from the from the least affected people to people who were unconscious, who were near death, who got to the point where the convulsions were, where if our responders had not gotten to them and pulled them out, they would have died right where they were. And we were able to locate where the plume was going to go, not from Denbury telling us, but I was able to get the amount of uh, product they believed to release. And I sent it to our National Weather Service, I was able to produce a plume cloud to me that resulted direct to the weather conditions of that night. And it showed me where it was going to go when we were able to send our responders house to house. And we removed 200 people that night out of the whole area. The next problem we had was actually getting to the people. They were having to go in on foot. Our vehicles wouldn't run because of the amount of CO2 that was in the air. It was shutting down our uh, gas run vehicles. It was, it was that thick. And, and if you know if a vehicle's not going to run, somebody can't breathe. Uh, this town was all, was a little over a mile from where the actual incident took place, where the actual eruption took place. So people say that it wasn't in close proximity, it was in too close of proximity. That's not necessarily the case. It's like a mile away. You ask about the valves, where they are. The valve, the shutdown valve on this one was nine miles up from where the incident took place. And this eruption went on for four and a half hours. Four and a half hours, CO2 went into this community. People say you can do these tests and uh, know how it's going to affect people and that's not the case either because shortly after this incident there was another incident where a valve was frozen shut and the more product was released in that controlled release than was in this particular explosion but it didn't affect anybody at all so don't tell me you, you can know how much is going to release and how, how it's going to affect people because i've seen it done both ways it's just not the case we really don't know what or how this product is going to react to people at this time as far as the guidelines go, PHMSA had guidelines in place before this took place. As a matter of fact, there was an investigation that showed they were in violation of a number of, of, of guidelines that's in there. And then they and they put some more in it. My biggest question to PHMSA and people who have these guidelines is, well, who is enforcing this? I mean, who, who's going to be the responsibility? Who's going to come out and enforce and make sure that we're going by the policies that we already have in place? Can't enforce the ones we already have. Doing more is not doing us any good. So not only do we have a requirement problem we have a problem with who's going to enforce what we have it's just it's a bad situation most of these places are in rural areas that are the responders that respond to them are going to be volunteers which the majority of the guys that we sent out there were volunteers besides our full-time people and, and they just don't know and if they're going to be in these places they're going to have to be required to uh, give the communities what they need to respond to these calls and the training they're going to need they're going to have to be transparent with the community you're going to have to have some kind of trespass back off from them. Saying, it's just a dangerous, dangerous situation. I don't think we know enough about it to, to just force it upon people at this time. Thank you. So it's, <clears throat> it is clear that we, we need a moratorium on these pipelines, given the risks that are involved and the uncertainty that is involved. And I believe now we can go to some questions from the audience. There's been a couple questions. Um, Eric, will you moderate the Q&A? We still have Lupe to present. 
Oh, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm not having a great day. Lupe, I am so sorry. Take it away, Lupe. <laughs> Let me unmute myself here. Thank you, Marta. No worries. Um, well, first of all, my name is Lupe Martinez. I live in the Central Valley. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of rural communities. Um, the concerns that we have as communities, and it, it's always happened to us, and um, as a fact that we're pretty much the communities always left out without real, really realizing uh, what's going on until we have our local problems that show up, um, you know, either issues with water, chemicals, pesticides, bad air, fire, or so on. The worst part is that most of these communities where we're at here in Delano, McFarland, and all these communities, um, they're talking about different plants coming in, um, you know, on this whole issue of the CO2. Uh, whether it's in McFarland and they're they're looking at a project that's only about two miles out from Delano, so it's in the center. Um, and then we have in Delano what used to be, which is a, a shutdown uh, biomass uh, plant, and they're talking about you know using that also for CO two and so on. Um, Bakersfield, uh, that community, they're talking about forty two hundred acres. Uh, to be used and as a huge industrial park for the CO2. Um, my, uh, the question is that our communities are really not involved. Most of these communities are farm workers. I mean, we're, we're all farm worker communities here and we don't have the luxury to be, you know, in the workshops and being part of the regulations. And even if we are part of the regulations, it is so difficult to understand the rules, uh, the regulations, and everything else. We, as communities, and I say for myself and my experience over years and years of promises that have been made to us, when we talked about, you know, when we talk about uh, oil and gas, uh, when we talk about pesticides, everything, and every every time we're told that there's no worries, um, and all of these are assumptions and theories that rely on false assumptions, really. And so the promises that were made um, never pan out. I mean, we start to see them, and we're seeing them as, as we go along right now. We see that uh, our communities have trouble with water, with pesticides, uh, and so on. But my next question is, how do we, how do we secure something that we have no knowledge of at this point? Or... And, and and of course, uh, the CO2 is going to have to have pipelines, even though in some of them we're told that there won't be, and they're going to try and get it, you know, at the source there. Um, I still don't, I, I have a real hard time with that. Um, we're always told that, you know, they're going to do the best to assure us, but what happens when they don't? And then we have something as, as what has happened in Sarsha. Um, and I think that at this point in trying to, uh, in the Central Valley with these communities, with our communities, um, how do we uh, alleviate the concerns uh, that, they, that people have? And I think at, at this point, I, I would also agree with Mark that I think we need a moratorium at this point until we are secure or better uh, understanding of what, what it is that we're trying to do. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lupe. And um, again, thank you all for coming. I wanna, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that I think maybe our, Amanda or Jack might be able to answer if you could take a look at those. And if uh, folks have a question, um, we can, I believe we can unmute you or Eric, what's the process? <clears throat> um, that's just to put their uh, questions in the chat and then we can read them out um, and see if one of the panelists can answer them. <clears throat> 
I can answer the question about how closely uh, do you feel California's protoc protocols uh, reflect FINSA guidelines. So um, currently the Office of the State Fire Marshal um, is a interstate agent for FIMSA enforcing the FIMSA regulations. So there, there's no um, currently above and beyond regulations in California specific to CO2 pipelines. I'm going to be. I, I see a question from Matt about increased safety measures. Where where our incident took place, and the reason we had an incident, it where the Mississippi Delta meets the hills is is where this happened. And I know that's odd for, for what we're talking about, but it was going from a from a hilly area to right to a flat valley, where I like to laugh and say you can watch your dog run away for days. And and, and what's built on the side of that is is something called Yazoo clay, which is a very unstable soil, and that's something that nobody looks into the requirements. They're still having problems even after this. With this, with this Yazoo clay moving. That's what caused that particular break in the pipeline that particular night. So this is something that needs to be added into it, where they are, the, the different locations and soil testing, things like that. It probably wasn't done before this pipeline was done. It's gonna to have to be buried and reburied below where it is now to make it a safe pipeline. So there's the question regarding, you know, recently, at, you know, we've heard this for the, certainly as through the scoping plan process, that uh, CCS and CO2 pipelines and a lot of assurances about safety. Uh, I'm not sure there's been a lot of different workshops. Again, I think we, we have real doubts about the ability to maintain safety. We have real doubts about the ability to monitor in real time these incidents, whether it's seismicity or leaks, pipes leak, that's what they do. Um, and and I, you know, if anyone else wants to speak to this issue around you know, the promises of safety that we're hearing from the industry. Oh, okay. Victoria, do you, uh, I think you have a question. Do you want me to? All right, so Victoria's question is, I think it's important that while California has a partial moratorium on CO2 pipelines, the law, the law still allows for pipelines that stay on facility property, including the ones Lupe mentioned. Companies therefore would therefore have proposed sending CO2 via truck or barge. Could the panelists discuss the risks of this type of transport? Well, I, uh, I think it's an important point that Victoria is raising uh, uh, because California's moratorium uh, until FEMSA regulations are finalized, as she says, applies only to the pipelines. But if you're going to bury it on site where it's generated, then you get around the moratorium. Or if you're going to collect it and then ship it by truck or barge, uh, you're not using a pipeline. And of course, uh, I mean, there are uh, trucks on the road right now that are carrying CO2 for various purposes. But uh, if 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 a truck loaded with uh, CO2 were to be in an accident, uh, of course, there would be an immediate cloud of CO2 uh, released at the site. And, if, and then the risks associated that would depend on whether it was in a populated area and so on. So it would be the same consideration. Similarly, with, with a, a barge that could uh, accidentally release CO2 and uh, uh, the 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 uh, impact of that would depend on the circumstances, uh, wh whether there were people around, how many people around, where it occurred, and so on. And uh, if Marilyn, I will allow you to ask your question. You should be able to ask now. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this presentation, um, because I attended the CARB webinar yesterday at 5.30, and I was in shock. Um, nothing of what you have said or Marjana, who represented Physicians for Social Responsibility, when she commented yesterday um, so that we could hear her. Um, so she introduced 
um, those thoughts about what's missing in this discussion um, in carb. And I feel like um, carb with, um, it's like um, undercover, under the radar, having promoted um, its policies under the guise of following the net zero, all the legislation passed to get to net zero and all this rah-rah business, but without any public involvement, really, um, I'm very active in my town and we spend a lot of time on the local issue with our refinery, let alone these huge issues that will involve our refinery. And I'm just, I, I consider CARB right now as a kind of um, dystopic um, remote kingdom, like a Wizard of Oz situation. And I'm very, very upset um, hearing this because I know they will reach out to their own districts. They'd have to, because they at least um, <clears throat> nominally govern them. And I, I don't know what BAQMD or uh, South Coast uh, QMD will do about this um, because we're talking about emissions here um, from leaks of pipelines or whatever, wherever these leaks come from, the soil, et cetera. So the siding is extremely important. Um, I'm against the whole thing. I think it's a boondoggle for the oil industry um, so that they can continue not only producing um, fossil fuels um, and keeping the whole system going. So I think that, and with um, the federal money coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, it's really, really, um, as Peter Montague, who I don't know who, I don't know who that is, but I saw a blog post by him that was extremely informative. And he's just calling that a circular economy. Um, it's all going to the oil industry. So Democrat, Republican, mm -hmm. I don't care who's promoting this, but it's it's really, really bad news for all of us, especially in what I call the canary communities. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, do we have any other questions? In particular, I'd like to invite any of the legislative staff uh, an agency staff that are on the line, if they have questions or comments they want to share. Um, Kathy has their hand raised. Let me allow you to. Mm -hmm. All right, Kathy. Hi, thank you. Um, both Marilyn and I live in Benicia, so we live very close to the Valero refinery. And we become aware of the proposed Montezuma project, which would lay pipelines through the Carquinez Straits and uh, then you dump the carbon in the Montezuma wetlands. Um, so I know that there is a partial ban, that there is a ban now on these CO2 pipelines, except within a facility. Um, do you know, uh, I, so I have a couple questions. One is, uh, is there any legislation being proposed at this time to eliminate that ban? Uh, secondly, how can CARB go ahead with these plans when the, the main mes method of transmission, the pipelines, is currently banned in the state? And third, what happens when these pipelines leak or burst underwater? Um, you know, Vallejo, it runs, uh, Valero, excuse me, runs its pipelines within a couple hundred yards of residential neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm assuming if there's ever a pipeline that, that goes to another place, they're going to use that same route. Uh, you know, my grandchildren live within uh, less than a kilometer from that. So this is something that I am just extremely concerned about. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. With, with regard to the uh, uh, underwater rupture, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, carbon dioxide uh, reacts with water to form carbonic acid. So the water where this rupture occurs would be acidified. And uh, the impact of that would, of course, depend on uh, uh, the <clears throat> various uh, water inhabitants, the fish and other wildlife that might be affected by that. So that you can imagine that there would be uh, an impact on on those uh, on those creatures if there were an underwater rupture, um, and uh, there's also a comment in the a chat about uh, 
uh, FIMSA regs should require companies to train and fund first responders. You know, Jack Willingham talked about the challenges that first responders faced. And I want to reemphasize what he said, that uh, when you get CO2 concentrations up to four or five percent in the ambient air, it's not only immediately dangerous to life and health to people, but it stops internal combustion engines from running. I, they they don't run at less than 16 or 17 percent oxygen in the air and four or five percent co2 is enough to displace that oxygen so now you need to think about uh how are, how are you going to get ambulances into places uh and you're and you're not going to be able to depend on uh, on internal combustion vehicles so we we'll have to be thinking about electric vehicles and also independent air supplies for first responders. So those are all things that need to be thought about and put in place uh, prior to an accident, uh, a, a rupture occurring, uh, and then uh, having to deal with it uh, on the fly as, as Jack and his team needed to do in Satarsha. Yeah, and I can add on to that a little bit too, just talking about the population density. So currently operators are required to identify high consequence areas um, in relationship to their pipeline and those definitions of how to identify high consequence areas are pretty vague, um, not very prescriptive. And uh, as we saw in the Satarsha incident, um, it's inaccurate. Um, Satarsha wasn't identified as a high consequence area in the Denbury incident. And so um, those those considerations absolutely need to be updated, and especially when thinking about running these pipelines through uh, more densely populated areas. If I can add um, on, there was an incident in Arvin, California with the pipelines that went underground there in a neighborhood that ruptured and uh, people got sick they were displaced from their homes for nine months living in a hotel in hotels the problem that we saw at that time is nobody knew that the pipelines were underneath there or no one really knew who it belonged to at this point and they kept saying the county kept saying that they were not active which was not true I mean, people got sick, people are still ill, and we have, the, so my thought is, if, if if in a small community, we're having this kind of a problem, what the heck do we think is going to happen throughout the nation with the pipelines and all the other stuff? We have so many questions, so many issues that we're not, we're not there. Uh, you know, Kathy was talking about the problems that we have locally. We have so many other issues locally. We have water issues with pesticides, with other things, with plumes, uh, all these other things as it is. And now to think that we're going to have these pipes coming through here, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm really concerned for my grandkids and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the questions are, can, we talked about the the more the current moratorium how might we can we explain a little bit more about the moratorium and what are how we can strengthen that so um senate bill 905 there's a provision in there preventing any new carbon dioxide pipelines from being built um, until FEMSA updates its federal regulations. Um, FEMSA has announced that it's going to be doing a rulemaking. Um, they held a public meeting in Des Moines, Iowa earlier this summer and uh, will hopefully be um, publishing the draft rules in early 2024. Um, the rulemaking process takes an extremely long time. Um, and so our concern, well, what's great about the, the California provision in SB 905 is that uh, it restricts CO2 pipelines from being built until those are updated. Um, the concern is that because that, that rulemaking takes such a long time that there will be efforts to roll back on those restrictions. Um, and so 
Um, I don't have any specific recommendations on how to strengthen um, SB 905 in that provision, but maybe other panelists do. Oh, we would like them to, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, what we've been looking for, I think, is an honest conversation about alternatives, right? If we continue to think that the only way out of climate change is the way we got here, right? Large scale production, large scale energy, right? And, and we're not looking at other, you know, solutions that are actually grounded in public health that keep fossil fuels in the ground that actually help us figure out a safer way to produce energy. You know, the large scale innovations we need, particularly in California, to scale out wind and solar. And if we need, the other part of that is there are, you know, there are some industries that are ready to be decarbonized with some of these tools, right? But we're moving toward, I just think we're moving in the wrong direction with the, the CO2 pipelines and carbon capture and sequestration particularly around the fossil fuel industry, right? That's not getting us, you know, the innovations that we need. And we might want to look at cement and glass and others first, uh, because those are, those are smaller and, and scalable. And I think we need to also think about technologies reversibility. Like what happens when you start, start seeing, you know, a spate of earthquakes? They're small, but there are a lot of them and that cumulative impact. We really don't know what the cumulative impact is of all those small earthquakes. When do we stop, right? If there's a monitoring process, this regulatory, lag, you know, there's a bureaucratic and regulatory lag between getting the information and actually acting on it. But if all we're going to do is monitor and say, oh yeah, there's earthquakes happening, but you know, we, we're going to keep doing this practice that is causing these earthquakes, then, you know, I think from a public health perspective, we should just not do that. Be really clear, you know, stop doing things that don't help. I wanna um, lift up a question from Vivian Navarro, who's, one of, who's joining us from um, one of the legislative offices um, in the state capitol. Thanks for joining us, Vivian. The question is, um, who performs the, the uh, assessment or evaluations to, to these areas in regards to determining if, whether or not they're high risk? Um, and what is or are the requirements or factors determine they are a risk? Well, let me take a, a shot at part of that. Um, um, as I as I mentioned in my presentation, people who are deciding about routing and siting of the pipelines need to go through uh, consider a number of factors, um, and among them are. Uh, if there's a rupture at a particular place, what volume of CO2 will be released or, or what are the anticipated amounts and where will it go? And in order to, to sort of try to answer that question ahead of time, you need to do modeling exercises. And so there are a number of models that are being used by various people to try to figure out where a CO2 plume would disperse, how it would disperse, how it would behave. And there are there are a number of models and some are more simple than others. And the more complex models uh, require a lot of computer time, a lot of resources to try to figure it out because they're able to and uh, they're able to uh, weave into the analysis wind speed and direction and various topographies and so on to figure out where this cloud is going to go. But uh, if you use a simpler model, uh, and that had been done actually in Satarsha, where a simple model was 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 used saying the plume was just going to stay locally, wasn't going to go into the town of Satarsha a mile away because they very, used a very simple model. So Satarsha wasn't considered a high risk area. It wasn't even it wasn't even on the on the map for the, for uh, an impact area. So I think that the, the challenge facing people who are making decisions about siting and routing means they're going to have to use more complex models that more realistically uh, uh, sort of represent what could happen and where these at-risk areas are. Uh, 
Uh, this is going to be critically important before there's an accident, uh, as opposed to looking back in retrospect. So I hope that addresses at least part of that question. And I can I can also speak what he's talking about the modeling. It's going to depend on the weather conditions of that night. It's not just going to depend on how much gas is going to be released or whatever. That particular night in Satarsha in Mississippi it was very unusual. It was like 40 degrees with no humidity, which caused when that CO2 released, that's what caused it all to go down to where they weren't expecting it to. It followed downwind and it stayed on the ground, stayed on the ground, stayed on the ground, which we weren't able to get people back into their homes for almost 14 hours later. The next day when humidity came back in and all that started dissipating out of the area. None of that was predicted on the plume cloud ahead of time. To go back to what you said earlier about getting first responders equipment, also air monitoring equipment needs to be provided to the first responders in there so they know when it will be safe to get the people in and out and back into these communities. And from a, a regulatory perspective as well, like Ted was talking about, there's multiple different models, um, much simpler ones, uh, much more complex ones. There's no um, required model as of right now. Um, and so operators aren't required to do this more complex, more potentially accurate modeling. And so, you know, you can hear from multiple sources that these are safety considerations that are being taken into account, but without prescriptive regulations, there's no requirement that operators do so. And then back to Jack's point that um, even sometimes when there are prescri prescriptive regulations, um, in the case of Satarsha, Denbury wasn't following a lot of those. And so who is holding these operators accountable um, and making sure that they're doing what they need to do? I may also add, I mean, I think as a member of the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, we've asked for full life cycle assessment. And what we've gotten a lot of is modeling around what emissions reductions we will get if we implement carbon capture and sequestration. What we do not see are these comprehensive uh, models around safety and what happens. We, you know, a, a, that is completely lacking. We've asked for these full life cycle assessments. We've asked for there to be no action on this until we know these things. And again, what we have felt is just this sort of tidal wave of interest and support in a technology that one is not bearing out the promises. We don't see the capture rates. We don't see why we would make these really dangerous infrastructure investments in communities that are already being uh, overburdened with pollution uh, and existing pipelines and existing uh, fossil fuel extraction and production. I, I have not been monitoring. Is there any other questions that we want to queue up or folks, uh, any other questions? Question from the mayor of Richmond, California, who's on the line, Eduardo Martinez. And the question is, will there be cathodic protections on underground pipes? There are federal regulations that require cathodic protection to be put on pipelines, underground pipelines. Um, as far as construction goes, it's my understanding that that cathodic protection doesn't need to be put into place until uh, I believe it's 12 months after um, the pipe has been put in the ground. So that's definitely a concern to think about. But yes, there is requirements for cathodic protection. Maybe we can lift up one last question. This is question comes in from, from Kathy Durvin. Um, most of these pipelines are currently in rural areas, low population density. That is not the same as where they might be built in California with much larger populations. What additional safety concerns does this raise? Well, it just seems to me that uh, that it, when, when you're putting something like this through a more densely populated area, you have to think about who is there and what are the risks. I, I keep thinking about, for example, if if there were a pipeline rupture near uh, a hospital or near an extended care facility, 3% uh, concentration in the ambient air uh, should not be uh, exposed to for more than 15 minutes, according to NIOSH, and at 4%, it's immediately dangerous to life and health. So now how are we thinking about evacuating people uh, 
uh, who might be hospitalized or otherwise somewhat uh, have limited mobility to get them out of such a cloud. And uh, that just seems to me to stray all kinds of interesting questions about how the pipeline is constructed in areas that are more uh, heavily populated, what wall thickness of the pipe, um, the, the spacing of the, the valves as, as uh, Amanda mentioned, uh, how do we avoid these ductile fractures that are going to release large amounts of CO2? All of those things come into real practical importance, particularly in these heavily populated areas. You know, there were there were 52 residents at Patarsha, Mississippi, and we transported 46 to the hospital that night. What did I tell you? And we put up the map. So that once again, we could see the red line is where the pipeline will lay. Uh, you know, looking at Southern California, look, it, it is a risk for entire all of California and both in rural and heavily populated areas. If I could also, uh, I just wanted to, to not have this um, get forgotten, but I wanted to make one more point about um, the SB905 moratorium, and thank you, Victoria, for clarifying that it's um, new pipelines outside of a, a facility, so they can still build them within the facilities. But I think the reason why this is such an important um, bill is that the federal regulations, the federal regulator has a statutory limitation um, called the 60104B Legacy Clause, which restricts FIMSA for, from uh, requiring any new safety regulations, um, or sorry, new uh, construction uh, regulations to existing pipelines. And so as FIMSA is writing their CO2 specific regulations, uh, any pipelines that are built before those new regulations come into play, they won't have to retroactively go back and change their pipelines. So when you're thinking about um, the construction aspect, thinking about where valves are placed, what type of steel is being used, any pipeline that is built before those regulations, potential updated regulations come out, they won't have to go back and change those. So I think that's a really important point to, to think about when you're thinking about the SB905 bill. I'd like to lift up a question from participant Kathy Carriage um, uh, in reference to the Montezuma project plan for the Bay Area. Um, where a pipeline is potentially placed underwater. What happens in, in the event of an underwater pipeline leak? Well, I mentioned that the acidification of the water that occurs when CO2 is released underwater. Um, and I don't uh, have more to add ex to what I previously said to that. Maybe others do. Yeah, I think this is still an area that needs more research and development as far as um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I would, you know, the regulations are likely insufficient to uh, ensure safety of potential ecosystem um, devastation in the event of a CO2 rupture underwater. So I think that this is just something that needs to be looked into more, um, as is most things that we've presented in this presentation. Do we have any other questions from um, the audience? I'm trying to go through I think one, one that we haven't addressed, um, this is kind of uh, panning out from the situation in California, is from Nora Privatera. What do you think of asking Congress to revoke the 45Q um, subsidies for uh, carbon capture to remove incentives for CCS? Well, I, you know, I, Congress isn't going to 
revoke the the forty five Q tax credits because they they've recently passed them uh, and actually increased them in the Inflation Reduction Act. But as others have mentioned, what this in fact is is doing is is uh, is promoting continued development of uh, fossil fuels. So. Um, it's it's turned out to be as, as somebody mentioned Peter Montague's analysis, which I highly recommend, is to point out that uh, the circularity here is that we'll be pumping more oil and gas, we uh, capturing CO two from that, uh, and then paying the companies to uh, either bury it or to use it for enhanced oil recovery. Um, and just to keep the fossil fuel cir circle going. Um, and uh, that's that's the impact of the 45Q tax credit, that it's it's public money that's that's funding these these pipelines uh, and in an attempt to clean up the pollution that's coming from the continued use of fossil fuels. I think Marta is making the point that we need to be thinking about alternative uh, ways of, of developing energy and so on that will get us off of that circular treadmill. Well, we're at 1240. Uh, we can, if there aren't any other questions, any burning questions that folks want to ask, we might let you leave a little early. You know, I, I, there is one question, it's a comment, Gene. State officials keep arguing that the risks with which they need to minimize are acceptable, um, that these risks that they're putting our communities in is acceptable given the urgency of the climate crisis. Uh, and we can't reduce greenhouse gas enough, so we need sequestration. Well, there are ways to sequester carbon that don't rely on building large scale infrastructure. And certainly through the EJAC, we've made lots of recommendations around how to do that through natural and working land, soil restoration, but we are not being aggressive enough in reducing our use of fossil fuels. One example is the resistance to address the issue of pesticides, both on the production side and the use side, right? They are related to our soil's ability to absorb carbon and be healthy and continue to, to allow us to grow food. Given that we've waited so long, We've got to start thinking about what are those restorative practices that will allow us to be more resilient. So how do we protect water, right? That's essential. How do we protect soil? And what are the, the practices, not just technologies, not just building big giant things. And I get that that's attractive, but that there are, we've got to find these other ways because we can't, and I, and we have to resist any solutions that continue to commodify fossil fuel production and its waste, right? Because then it's really hard to stop, right? Because somebody's on the money train and, you know, people are benefiting from it, from it. and then it's impossible for us to stop. So we, we will be on this cycle as Ted, Ted and Peter talk about. So I think uh, there is urgency, but, uh, you know, as my friend's mom used to say, doing something is sometimes not better than doing nothing. And I'm not saying do nothing, but this is not the better thing. This is not the thing to meet the level of urgency that, that is climate change, right? Given the risks of the pipeline, who, who's there? And if we're serious about environmental justice and making amends for the damage we've done, we can't continue to expect communities like Lupe's and others to bear the brunt of the burden while the oil companies reap in tax benefits and record profits. That is the danger of net zero, right? Because it allows you to commodify these emissions, whether they're from dairies or carb, you know, commodifying carbon. The question in uh, in the chat about the uh, story in the Guardian from this past Sunday about the gold rush and the CCS boom in Louisiana. So I want to see if someone wants to answer that. But also, 
before uh, before that, um, give you all a heads up that uh, PSRLA is planning a follow-up webinar um, in a few weeks' time, date still to be determined in early September, um, that will pan out and take a national view. And so we'll invite some of our partners from around the country um, to look at what's happening um, with CCS development and specifically carbon pipeline development around the country. So we'll certainly um, send you an email invitation for that event. That being said, does anyone is anyone able on the panel to speak to um, the CCS boom in Louisiana and the and the article that's referenced from the Guardian from this past weekend? I haven't read the article, but I was recently in Louisiana and you know talking to advocates who are facing these pipelines and the city of Louisiana. You know, so there's a lot of act activism. The city has uh, made a move to 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 try to stop some of the CCS development, but I think, you know, it, it, you know, and I, I, you know, what can I say about Louisiana? Not only are we planning, you know, CCUS facilities throughout Louisiana, they're also co-locating more petrochemical companies, right? So that we can continue to produce more, both oil and petrochemicals and pesticides, right? That then continue to make the climate crisis and the pollution and environmental justice crisis worse. So we need a national response, but given, you know, but we also need the state of California to step up into its leadership that it has been claiming on climate to actually come up with real solutions. These are, these are, these are dead ends, uh, but they're expensive dead ends because they come with long standing infrastructure that will be there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We cannot afford that. We just simply can't. I want to call up a comp. Yes, calling it net, net zero, it's it's a misnomer. Uh, we've been saying that all along. We need real zero solutions. We need to set targets that we can meet. Uh, and some of those targets that we can meet are actual using the environment to naturally sequester carbon in ways that are regenerative. Uh, so those are the solutions that we should be focusing on first, figuring out you know these tech solutions that create profit centers for the people who got us into this mess is not the path forward. Do you have any new questions? If I see that there's a comment uh, in uh, from Kathy uh, in the chat. It's asking mm -hmm. about sequestering carbon in rocks. Um, and that gets to uh, some of what um, Marta was saying, and th that there are ways to think about mineralizing carbon dioxide by capturing it from the air and mineralizing it so that it's permanently sequestered in rocks as, as carbonates. And there are there are companies that are working very hard on that. Uh, and it, it's another way of thinking about sequestering carbon uh, permanently in rocks where we're not burying it underground and hoping that it stays there where we put it. So that that's one of the technologies that's being developed. There are also technologies that are being developed to think about how do we increase CO2 absorption in oceans, uh, as well as the land-based uh, approaches that Marta mentioned. So there are a number of ways of thinking about uh, getting carbon out of the air, uh, as well as, of course, the importance of stop putting it in there to begin with, which is what we're focusing on here with the fossil fuel combustion. Thank you, Ted. All right. I don't see any more. Oh, I don't see any more questions. So do any of our panelists want to add anything to help us wrap up? We've got, so we, we're at 12.48 and we were scheduled to one. We're trying to get folks out a little early, but if any one of our panelists has um, final comments, I invite you to make them. No? Okay. Um, 
I want to thank you all for coming. We will make the slides available for you if you're interested and keep an eye out for the follow up webinar where we will be talking uh, with groups from Louisiana and other states. And so again, thank you for your participation. Thank you. And feel free, you know, for LEG staff and others, feel free to reach out to, to us if you're also interested in reaching out to any of the other uh, speakers, if you're interested in more information uh, and how we can get this right in California. Thank you. Thanks. I'll close it here.